button about it. And the recording, we will also share it afterwards. Uh, that is also to share it with uh, interested people because the aim of the webinar is to uh, enhance discussions and so that people can reach out to others if they see or hear something uh, interesting. So we would ask, ask you to write your questions in the chat function and uh, the questions will be dealt with uh, at, uh, in the Q&A round at the, at the end of the, of the webinar. You will notice that some presentations will be in Norwegian, some will be in English. Uh, and also for the questions, feel free to use what is most comfortable for you. Um, so we, we can have just, uh, you can use any language uh, you want. So... Um, and the, pro the program looks as, is as follows. So uh, roughly speaking, we will have an, a welcome and an introduction by um, Andreas of Steam and Trolls of UIS. Then we will have um, the, a bunch of, uh, of a set of uh, research, more oriented talks, let's say, or from the viewpoint of the, of the science. And then indeed, we will also have some uh, industry experience from about collaborating with research environments. And after that, we have the Q&A. Round. So you see we have a good program uh, until uh, 11. With this, I would kindly like to give uh, the, the virtual floor to Andreas. Uh, so Andreas being the leader of STEAM Aqua, the Aqua Cluster, who will indeed tell us more about STEAM. Andreas, I hope you're there. Yeah. Tusen takk, Karin. Eh, takk for introduksjonen, og, og takk for eh, samarbeidet med, med å organisere dette webinaret eh, om de mulighetene som ikke er tett av samarbeid med, mellom industrien og, og forskningsmiljøet. Eh, innledningsvis vil jeg bare, for de som ikke kjenner så godt til eh, de makrokluster-prosjektet, eh, så kan jeg si litt innledningsvis om det. Hvis du egentlig bare går tilbake til den framtiden, eh, Karin. Den, den viser egentlig med at den, uh, de, de områder, hadde du mulighet til det, Karin, to go back to the first uh, slide you had? Um, hang on. With the picture? Uh, yeah. No. Okay, hang on. I have to. No, I can, okay. I don't know. Why? I'm sorry. I, I have to. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, I the market cluster, so uh, so how many? Um, uh, that's that's correct. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. <laughs> that, that's the flow. This was you may yeah. use there uh, very good and dynamic and some from the office now in the steam market cluster. Um, I have no good tea, uh, medlemma in Klinger, uh, they put price sourcing and would flower the hair. Interessante teknologitrender man nu ser i norsk havbruksnæring i dag, både innenfor eh, landbasert eh, oppdrett, eh, lukka, eh, semilukka i sjø, eh, eksponert havbruk, eh, det er også et av Blue, Blue Research, eh, som er eh, FOU-konstitusjoner som klynger sammen med NORS eh, har søkt om, eh, og vi har også innovasjonssenter vårt eh, oppe til venstre bilde, vi har et hus uh, som, som etablerer fra 1. og 1. Uh, 2021. Uh, så du, du kan gå videre, Karin. Så uh, Steam Aqua Cluster uh, oppstart i 2019 med 40 uh, medlemmer. I dag er vi 110 uh, medlemmer. Vi opplever betydelig interesse for klynger uh, og for de satsingene som områder som, som klynger jobber etter. Uh, det som kanskje er det er litt unikt med denne havbruksklinga her, at vi har over lengre tid gjennom Blue Planet arbeidet tett med den etablerte næringen og industrien, altså med oppdrettsselskap, med forleverandører, med hva det er etablerte teknologileverandører, men som har nå et rett samarbeid med mange av de her nye selskaper. Nye selskaper som kommer fra maritim, eh, olje og gass eh, og, og andre sektorer som satser på landsiktig med varme og videreutvikle eh, havbruksnæringen. Eh, I tillegg så har vi jo offentlige 
public partner uh, om har uh, letande forskningsmiljö genom universitetets poänger uh, med klima och norsk uh, som uh, har bred kompetens och understötta uh, bedriften i deras FU-projekt. Uh, och till slut då som jag bara nämna att vi har uh, närmare 30 sällskap uh, som uh, är det vi kallar tidigfasen uh, som kommer in med spännande nya innovationer och ny teknologi uh, som skapar en, en, en dynamik i klyngor som är väldigt intressanta. Mm -hmm. uh, då får vi höra i um, Andreas, can you? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you come a bit closer to the mic, to your microphone? Yeah. Because okay. we are. Um, it's a bit hard to uh, to understand everything. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you can just go to the next slide. Yes. So uh, for for Steam Aqua Cluster, it's a uh, victory for us, summoned by Forsking Forsking Sportman Bora och kunna etablera fler starka arenor för att få till och den kopplingen mellan industrin och forskningspartnerna både för att bli bättre känd med den kompetensen som sitter i forskningsmiljö men också för att identifiera felles projekt eh felles program det går att söka på för att få riskavlastning i bedriften sina FOU-projekt. Eh, vi har vår eh, lång erfaring i, i Steam, i klyngeadministrationen genom Blue Planet i att arbeta och understötta sällskap i sina FOU-projekt. Eh, och vi sitter bland annat då på, på vri kompetensmäglar genom Morten Bergslin, som egentligen är en, en väldigt grej ordning som, som är väldigt fint att man är klar över. Då du kan eh, ganska lätt söka om inte 200 000 för att kunna köpa forskningskompetens i ditt projekt, alltså tjänstkompetensen, in i sitt FOU-projekt. Och där är det bara 20 procent egeninsats som, som är krav i från sällskapet i sida. Så, så för de som inte är klar den ordningen så är jag på kontakt med, med oss i ITKAN. Och i tillägg nu så prövar vi bland annat genom eh, detta webbinar med UIS och NORS nu identifiera flera av de verktygen som ligger både i nationella program och europeiska program eh, framöver. Mm -hmm. Så um, så detta är en, en god start på att få eh, bättre samhandling med forskningspartnern vår och industrin eh, och så kommer vi att ha större fokus på detta och eh, i, i Steam samarbete. Tack. Thank you very much. I will now give the word to over to uh, Truls, Truls Gide Jakobsen of UIS. Truls. Ja, tack ska du ha kan. Ehm, uh, jag tror bara att det på norsk dansk. Se vi vi det vill ju han säger i god fortsättelse till det Andreas var akkurat inne på. Alltså universitetet har ju nu som de flesta vet en ny ledelse och det är väldigt mycket fokus på og den her nye strategi, hvor der er sådan tre hovedtematikker på, som vi har fokuseret på. Men den store ting i midten, det er jo den her skift med grønne omstilling. Altså regionen er jo i en omskift, som jeg ikke behøver at fortælle om, men der kommer til at se mye spændende fremover. Og, og den her område inden for akvakultur, og, og sådan generelt er jo også et kæmpe område, som vi, som vi ser på os. Så der er jo godt samarbejde, og den her typisk form for seminar, vi har i dag, er noget, der kommer til at være mye mere af også i fremtiden. Så øhm, jeg har ikke så meget tid, så jeg tager, jeg tager den næste slide. Og det, som vi jo har vældig fokus på sammen med institutsektoren og sådan, det er jo på en måde i fællesskab med industrien, det er jo at skaffe midler til forskning. Og der her har man en vældig sådan, øh, stor oversigt over de forskellige områder, vi jobber på. Og det er jo et vældig stort bredt øh, læret, som går fra alt for sådan mere samarbejdsprojekter, som man har, innovationsprojekter, som er typisk inden for forskningsrådet, EU, som man har hen til højre, Kommer det her nye horisont Europa, som der sikkert har hørt om, det er jo en kæmpe stor sak. Men det, som er pointet, det er, at vi må altid balancere med samarbejde med industrien, og så de her mere, sådan mere grundforskningsprojekter, som, er, som man ser i den øverste del i Fod Forskningsrådet, og også Excellent Science inden for Europa. Så her er der myre at hente, og der er virkelig mange gode muligheder i fælles 
grøn platform står jo også her, som den nye SARC, som kommer. Så øhm, tager vi næste slide. Øhm, en af et, det her det er et eksempel på noget, som øh, vi har jobbet med i, øh, i et par år snart, men det er på, hvordan vi ser øgt samarbejde med, med industrien, med næringslivet og arbejdslivet generelt. Vi har jo traditionelt har der været mye med sådan, at man har øh, forskerprojekter sammen med, med der i industrien, og, og så søger man en af de forskellige muligheder, jeg viste før. Men det ofte vi har set, som er en vældig god måde at starte et godt samarbejde på, det er jo studentbaserede projekter. Så der er jo projekter, som er baseret på med, med master og bachelor. Øh, nederst på den slide, så kan I se noget, der hedder samarbejde.us.no. Hvis der ikke har prøvet det før, hvis der ønsker en student til at jobbe med nogle konkrete problemstillinger hos der, så brug den portal, meld det ind. Og en af mulighederne, det er det her, der hedder Ingenius. Og det baserer sig på en udfordring, som, øh, som man har, en challenge som sagt, og der kan man jo så få nu en, en gruppe af studenter, som adresserer det over et semester, for at prøve på at komme op med nogle konkrete øh, forslag og løsninger. Og for studenterne er det jo en kæmpe erfaring, for industrien så er det jo en stor nytte, og det har vi haft nogle eksempler med, og man får vældig god tilbakemelding, og for universitetet bliver det jo en del af vores nye tilnærming, som er Challenge Based Education. Så der starter op et nyt kul her øh, til, til våren, øh, som der står her i begyndelsen af januar, der skulle vi gerne få øh, nogle challenge. Så hvis der har nogle konkrete eksempler, så en af de der punkter under samarbejde.us, øh, der kan man melde det ind. Ellers så kan I tage kontakt med mig eller andre. Så tror jeg, jeg stopper her. Okay, tusind tak, Truls. Then we um, can now indeed uh, go to the next um, presentation, and that is uh, Mukchen. Mukchen, please, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, uh, okay, I saw the non-international Tartakare, so I will be present here for English. So I would like to present in English because I see some international uh, participants. So I'm going to talk about the aquaculture technology research at UIS. Uh, my name is Mok Chen Nong. I'm a professor in uh, marine technology and leader of the OTIX Ocean Technology Innovation Cluster Stavange. And uh, there are two more presenters. Uh, one is uh, Mark and another Ragnar. They are going to talk about the marine, bio marine biology and also the economy. But uh, I will focus on the, the technology, the marine hydrodynamics uh, structures and, and also some of the oxygen uh, distribution in the cage. So uh, give introductions, uh, ocean is one of the strategy uh, area uh, for our faculty, Faculty of Science and Technology. And uh, we set up the, a group uh, called OTIX, Ocean Technology Innovation Cluster Stavange, uh, with uh, 13 the professor and researcher uh, from five departments uh, from Faculty of Science and Technology, including the business school, US, US Business School. So we cover technology, uh, biology, and also the economy and also risk, risk management. So the, we are also the partner in the STEAM and uh, partner of the Norwegian uh, Marine University Consortium. I can look at these uh, uh, figures. Uh, it covers the different activities uh, in the oceans uh, from the deep water all the way to the shallow water. Uh, based on this one, uh, we formed uh, four uh, important research areas in Norway. They are the aquaculture technology, the traditional offshore and subsea technology, and offshore wind and Final is the field crossing because we are building the bridges to connect the islands for transport, logistics, and tourists. And uh, come to the competence, uh, we have the, this marine advanced computational groups. So we focus on three uh, lines. One line is uh, as we need to work together with industry because we educate the student and then we need uh, industry to recruit our students. So we we'll focus on the quick solutions quick and, uh, and accurate solutions. It's called marine operation installation for designs. And uh, we also work on high fidelity uh, 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 solutions uh, uh, based on the marine CFD. But this takes a long time to do simulations, but normally we pre-calculate and use the coefficient for this one to, so that we can achieve a, a, a accurate result and robust result. And finally, we also focus on the mechanical uh, analysis. Uh, this basically for the subsea, because in the deep water, we have the, the subsea uh, 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 modules, a lot of things. And uh, then I look, introduce some tools we are using, uh, can be used for industry partner. 
They are CIMA. CIMA is uh, created by SingTap Ocean. I was the employee from CIMA previously. And uh, we this one can use for lifting operations, uh, fish catch simulations, uh, also the, the VIV, and including the fully coupled uh, offshore uh, wind turbine, both for bottom fix and horizontal wind turbine. And uh, we also developed a new the open source uh, based on the EDF. And this code actually for the nuclear plant design, but uh, we have in, we have put in the marine hydrodynamics uh, forces and uh, so that to study the structural response of the fish cage. And this can be used for the for the fish cage design also now. But it, this is open source without without license. It's from UIS. And we also work on uh, open form. Open form is an open source CFD tools. Uh, and you can see there here we do the, the, the flow around the two pipelines, uh, free FSI, free structure interactions. Uh, in order to do a CFD, we have the computer, supercomputer, we have access to the to the national infrastructures for the high performance computing. We can use 56,000 CPUs. Uh, we got uh, 3 million CPU hours per year from Notur. Uh, it means that we can run 345 CPU uh, parallel for 365 days nonstop. And uh, in house, we UIS, we also have a cluster. Currently, our cluster size is 584 CPU. Uh, and uh, we have been using this uh, for industry uh, partner to do some the, uh, simulation and designs. So all the code I show can in integrate inside. And this code is uh, open source also. So and the open form and also the code as the open source have been combined together to do the fish cache. I will show you the result later uh, and also free of charge. So now come into the, the area, we have four area based on uh, this, uh, but today I will focus on the aquaculture technology. Why offshore? Uh, you can see from this map, there's a lot of fish cage along the coast, so it's crowded. So we need, if in, good, in, in order to increase the production and reduce the impact to the environment, we need to go offshore. When you come to offshore, then the challenge is the wave, the wind and current low. And also we need to have a robust structure. Also, we need to talk about, think about the operation and maintenance and also the fish welfare. So all this we need to, there are new challenges for, for this aquaculture technology for offshore environment. For the typical gravity uh, fish cage, uh, is, uh, HS is uh, around two, but can up to uh, four meters, the significant wave height. Uh, this kind of cage is, uh, is, uh, is not expensive, but uh, if you go to offshore, it's a big challenge. But we have to use our code to, to reproduce all this result. And also, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also to create the, the fully coupled code, uh, uh, combine the open form and code ester so that we can study the flow around the, the uh, and including the flow structures at the back. So this is a fully a coupled FSI models. And we have compared with experiment, and this is an experiment from SyncTap Oceans. So we're able to compare well with the experiments. And also we study the wake uh, effects in a, a fish farm, especially you have uh, multiple cages and uh, then you need to know the shooting effect because uh, there will be a reduction in the velocity in the cage and this will cause a pollution and uh, not good uh, environment for the fish. So we also to study the, how this uh, wake effect in the cage. And also fully coupled model, you can see here is a, a structure response including the flow around structures and also the shooting effect. So uh, this has been uh, written in the paper, now it's under review in the Journal of Free and Structures. And also we compare with the experiment data uh, uh, based on the, all the speed and the forces. And we also can use this uh, open source to uh, uh, do uh, a lot of study. For example, this one is a morning line uh, broken and how the, actually the fish catch response, all this. So it's fully coupled models. And we also can switch off the, the open, open form and only use the core ester to do the fast simulations. So, yeah. And uh, we can use the code to do the large fish cage. Uh, we have been studying this uh, misalignment uh, angle because you, you have the half farm concept. This is uh, the original one. Uh, we use this one as an example. Uh, then we study the, how the shooting effect. So we study the misalignment angle and uh, do a lot of environment condition with different uh, solid layer, the, the cage uh, uh, solid layer, and see uh, how what is the condition we need to use a DP uh, for to have a misalignment so that we ha can have a good uh, uh, flow inside the cage. 
And this is our inventions. Uh, we got uh, both the Norwegian and Chinese patent. Uh, this is called module-based offshore fish farm. Now it's a support by Valide. It's helping us to commercialize this. We are going to apply the funding also for innovation projects. And what, what good things about this cage uh, is like uh, it's a single mall and, uh, and it's module-based. Uh, and then so that each cage can be captured in the smaller uh, shipyard. So you do need a very large shipyard. And each cage can have 400,000 fish. And you can connect together and then you can sink to the sea bottom uh, uh, to shun away the, the, the typhoon, uh, the high loading, the hydraulic loading. Yeah. And, uh, and they have no blockage of the water. The, so they will get a good quality of the water inside the cage. And we have carried out the experiment to study the forces. Uh, and then we'll continue working on this cage at this moment. So if anyone interested can contact us uh, on this cage. And also we're working on feeding tubes, uh, how these uh, feeding tubes uh, behave uh, in the oceans. So we do the fully coupled simulations for feeding tubes and see how this feeding tube should be arranged. Recently also we worked on the, how actually the feeding tubes uh, affect uh, microplastic because uh, the, the, they will be, will be air-based or, or using the water base and then you can have some abrasion in the, in the, in the PVC pipe. Uh, and then the, we, we correct the uh, microplastics. So we study all these uh, abrasions, how this particle actually uh, have a friction on the pipe and how much the uh, abrasion happen. And also we can study the, also can study the food pellets uh, and also the, all the plastic uh, inside the water, how they, how actually they behave. And we are the partner in this uh, smart aquaculture research center in uh, South Korea. Uh, they are working on many on the land base. And uh, we are the only partner, international partner for this uh, uh, research center in South Korea. It's seven years, uh, around seven, uh, 6.2 million US dollar. Seven years uh, research center. And we are working with them in this uh, flow through tank. They do the measurements. And then uh, we use the open source, open form. Uh, we create uh, the oxygen solar. So we, have, we can solve the concentration of oxygen in the in tank. You can see here, we uh, inject the oxygen and then how the oxygen actually the, distribute in the, in the tank. So in different level and compare with the experiment result. And uh, we also can study the contaminant transport, uh, environment DNA and salmon lines transport in the ocean. We use the ocean modeling, uh, take the contaminants, uh, environment DNA and salmon lines as a source. So then we can actually uh, see the distribution of, of all these concentrations in the ocean modeling code. So I have to show all the activities. Uh, so I would like to end my presentation here. Uh, feel free to ask the question. You can ask in both Norwegian and English. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mukchen. Indeed, it's uh, uh, people can ask questions. We still ask people to uh, write them in the chat for the moment, so we can also have the discussion then uh, towards uh, the end uh, of the webinar. So um, thank you very yeah. much. Yes. We can now then um, proceed with Mark. Mark, uh, Mark, I hope you are um, ready. Can you please share presentation? Thank you. Yeah, I hope you see something. Uh, yes, we see you and we hear you. But not we, the full screen. It's not on the full screen yet, but. Uh, yes, oh, there okay. it is. Again. Yes, there it is. We we can see it. You see, you see full, oh, hang on, resume, show. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, uh, first, Beklager, men, ek snak ishi norsk, so I will have to do it in the Norwegian. My excuse is I came to Norway last year, but in a month's time, that is no longer last year, so I better start learning Norwegian. But uh, when I uh, came to Norway, uh, one of the attractions was the amazing aquaculture uh, potential and already opportunities here, uh, largest uh, salmon producer in, in, in Europe, uh, and an amazing coastline. I mean, 30,000 kilometers to do things. Uh, if you include the islands, 100,000 kilometers of amazing coastline uh, where you can do lots of, of things. Well, but one thing, and forgive me, uh, maybe it's very black and white, uh, but I see a lot of salmon. Now, obviously, it's a big, big thing, but 
there are so many more things that people can do. So I'd like to present one on lobster. I mean, it's not true. I mean, Asbjorn Densik from Norwegian Lobster Farm is here as well. So there are people doing other things, but there's so much other opportunities, uh, seaweed, lots of other animals that uh, could be used in a sustainable way to produce uh, protein to the future. Yeah, so, so I'd like to present some work I've uh, done before on um, on a novel uh, offshore sea culture for European lobster. So uh, although I'm uh, from the uh, from the Netherlands originally, I spent uh, more than 20 years in, in Britain before I came to Norway. And the last 12 years, I was at the University of Exeter in the Southwest. And uh, by training, I'm a molecular biologist, but I'm interested in animal pathogens of both livestock and fisheries. And I've got projects on, on both of those. Uh, when in Exeter, we had a strong collaboration with a UK government agency called CFAS, which is the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Agriculture Sciences. And together we set up the Centre for Sustainable Agriculture Futures, which is because of uh, the massive growth potential of, of aquaculture. Uh, we have what 20% of animal protein comes from fish. Uh, we have a growing world population uh, to maybe 9 billion people in 30 years time. Traditional crops are not really producing. The last 10 years output from standard cereals and crops have been reduced, but the fishing industry is growing. And as you know, uh, since what 2016, aquaculture has overtaken uh, caught fish uh, in production. So this is a, a massive opportunity to provide uh, high quality animal protein to the growing world population. So the aim of that center is um, to provide scientific support uh, uh, and especially because disease causes massive losses in the agriculture industry. And uh, we had very strong uh, molecular uh, parasitology and pathology expertise together with uh, CFAS, which uh, is monitoring uh, by the fish inspectorate and providing policy advice to the government. This is a great opportunity to, to do things together. And my role was together with David Bass uh, to be the theme lead in aquatic diseases. Uh, as I said, disease is a big problem. And uh, we, uh, because of our, our knowledge in molecular biology and genomics, we normally are involved in identification of novel and emerging diseases. We isolate the pathogens, sequence genomes, provide diagnostic tools, uh, which help to monitor and uh, prevent these diseases. So the project I'd like to talk about is uh, on the European lobster, Hummerus gammarus, which is, as you know, is quite important animal and also socially an important organism. It's uh, obviously here in Norway as well. People are allowed for one month a year to catch them. Uh, it's been traditionally an important animal. And so it's the most valuable animal caught in, in the UK and quite a lot of other places because of its uh, quite high price. I mean, crustaceans count for 10% of global fisheries but uh, value-wise, they are 25% of first sale value. So these are commercially extremely interesting uh, organisms, but because of their high value, there has been an enormous amount of fishing pressure. In the UK, for example, Scotland is at around at the, the, the borderline of sustainability of, of catching fish. Because of this uh, massive overfishing in several places, including Scandinavia, but also the Mediterranean, uh, uh, populations of lobsters have been seriously affected by overfishing. So um, because of that, together with the National Lobster Hatchery in Southwest England in Cornwall, uh, the Lobster Grower Project was set up, which was a two million pound, what's well, the very second phase, two million pound uh, project with uh, the National Lobster Hatchery, the University of Exeter, CFAS, the government agency, a commercial mussel, mussel grower and Falmouth University, where we wanted to see if we could uh, reintroduce uh, lots of uh, larvae at sea or hatchlings at sea to support uh, uh, the populations of lobsters and also to see if there's commercial possibility to rearing lobster and not sell them as, as adult weight but as langoustine size to uh, various restaurants. But if you put a lot of animals together then obviously there are other effects that you might not uh, know and lobster is normally grown solitary so as you know increased stock densities will normally lead to disease and uh, growth effects. So there were a uh, novel basis so they used uh, oyster, uh, oyster uh, containers and novel containers on muscle lines, so this was in the southwest of England, where 15,000 uh, juveniles have been deployed over uh, uh, two years, and we followed them during the study. So we're very interested in what happens to lobsters. There's very little known uh, of diseases. Lobsters normally caught and live solitary, so we don't really have a lot of the, uh, understanding of disease. There have been some serious diseases, uh, mainly in the, in the American lobsters. So we wanted to know which diseases are actually prevalent or present in lobsters. And we also, because of the uh, modern interest in the microbiome and its influence on health, 
we wanted to study the difference between lobsters living in the hatchery and lobsters uh, living at sea, and if they could influence our musicians for uh, cultivation. So that's how we started. So when we started, it was almost like a kind of murder mystery because uh, on the day we were in the hatchery the first time, they told us that there was an unexplained mortality. So they had a lot of uh, deaths, uh, quite mass mortalities. They had no idea what the, was the cause. They had cleaned the whole system, sterilized all the systems and still had the death. One thing was uh, they also had some brood stocks or some uh, some hens coming in with this. And uh, obviously that was a little bit. So we, we thought, OK, we're going to take those uh, unusual eggs and we start using some traditional histology or histopathology to uh, to see what's there and do molecular biology in the hope that we can actually find something so we can actually monitor incoming brood stock if there's an issue. So here's a picture of the these colored eggs, these orange ones. So when we took them for histology, sometimes all the egg mass was totally disappeared and was replaced by uh, by kind of high full biomass. Here you see the edge of an egg. And here you see uh, the hyphae coming through. So when we isolated DNA and sequenced uh, the, uh, what the organism was, we were surprised to see that it was a parasite which were, was causing an outbreak of disease in South African abalones. Uh, so I think that's Eurosnegler in Norwegian. So there was a massive outbreak. Uh, a friend of me was actually doing a project unknown to us, uh, helping the South African abalone farms to find out what the cause was. This, this organism was never before seen. So when we then started uh, developing diagnostics primers, so the organism is called Halostichidia nerduliformans, and we took all the environmental samples that CFAS had collected over the years. So there would be marine samples, freshwater samples, and uh, terrestrial samples. We found this parasite almost everywhere. So this was an unknown parasite, which was already present in, in Europe. It's the first record of this parasite in European lobsters. But actually, it's also the first uh, report of this parasite in any animal. Yeah? And because it also infects abalone, it might actually be uh, infecting many other organisms. So this is one of an example. No one is monitoring. We know what happens if things uh, we don't. We have obviously the corona outbreak is the reason we now uh, talk to computers. Uh, increased monitoring is always important. There is a cost aspect that if you are interested in certain organisms, it might be good to monitor, even if the government says that there is no need to monitor, because as you see here, this was a disease we didn't know uh, was present in Europe. In addition to this uh, murder mystery, we also the standard thing uh, we wanted to do was anyway to do a large health screen. So we uh, took a lot of animals from uh, from uh, the marine cages and look if there was uh, any any health issues. So we screened over 1,500 animals for disease, and in one of eight or 12 percent of the cases, we saw some unusual histology. So we saw some uh, some problems in in uh, in in the uh, nuclei of muscle tissue. And when we were zooming in using electron microscopy, we see all these particles. So we saw viruses in uh, organisms that were apparently healthy, but apparently were also carrying a lot of uh, virus particles. Um, so if you then check over time, so this is in blue, you have the sea-based cultures, and in green, we have the hatchery control cultures. You see that in the first year, everything seems to be fine, but Organisms that are at sea actually seem to be less prone to having the virus than organisms that are kept in the hatchery. Also, virus never seen in clawed lobsters before. So, like the previous parasite, this was a, a first ever virus found in, in a lobster. And uh, as I said, we're not sure uh, if there's any clinical significance, but I'll come back to that later. Um, but because they are present in quite high numbers in the hatchery, uh, like in other aquaculture settings, you rather not have any uh, parasites or potential parasites in any of your uh, your animals. So in addition to the standard health screen, we also uh, wanted to look over the years uh, what happened to the uh, microbiome of these animals. So here you've got a picture of, of the cages of the containers hanging down from muscle lines. Um, so over the course of two years uh, from both sea and land, we took uh, uh, 2,000 animals, and we sacrificed them and studied the, the micro, microorganisms living in their guts. So we did a microbiome study. And um, I hope this thing turns in the right way, but it was pretty clear when looking over time that you could see the differences based on age, but also you can see the difference between hatchery and sea. So in the uh, green is where we start at point zero, and then in the brownish color, you see where we end up uh, over a year at, at the hatchery. And the other colors are the populations at sea over a year. 
So you can clearly see there is a, a clear difference between animals uh, living at sea. So these are the ones at sea. It started here, and then you see that the hatchery ones have a different microbiome compared to the ones at sea. If you're, so this is a different depiction. So this graph shows that the, uh, the actual bacteria living in the gut are very different as well. So we start in the middle. Uh, you, you can ignore the names, but the colors present uh, certain groups. So the gray bar is Fibrio. This is a very common marine bacterium. Which they start at 0 0.0. Then on the left is the hatchery ones, and going to the right are the microbiomes or organisms living at sea. Um, we lost uh, some samples, unfortunately, in the middle, but you can clearly see that the colors on the left in the hatchery are very different from the colors on the right at sea. And you can see that certain uh, microbes, like in green and this blue color, are more prominent uh, over time. And interesting, this one in the blue color is a, an organism called Candidatus hepatoplasma, which uh, becomes a quite large fraction of the animals uh, in living at sea. And from previous research, it's shown that there's a positive correlation with health in crustaceans if uh, this bacterium is present. As I said, we had a virus uh, with, uh, in, in the cultures and we didn't see if there's any clinical effect. But if you compare the microbiome of healthy animals compared to the microbiome of infected animals, you see that the disposition is higher. So the microbiome in healthy animals or without the, the virus have a more diverse gut compared to the ones in the virus. So the virus containing uh, lobsters have a less diverse microbiome and diversity of microbiomes is normally associated with health. So the more diverse a microbiome, the healthier an organism. So although we're not sure what the clinical relevance is, there might be an issue with if there's a virus, uh, there's a problem with bacteria being able to, to grow, or it might be that organisms with a different microbiome can prevent uh, a virus. In, Microbiome study is always difficult to have cause and effect. Uh, to summarize this part, um, so the cultural environment does impact the gut microbiome of uh, lobsters. So we know this is known in other organisms, including humans, that there is a health effect on the microbiome. It's clearly that animals living at sea have a different microbiome compared to living at land. And we can see that the presence of a virus negatively influences the gut microbiome. So to summarize this, so it's, it shows uh, that we found that animals living at sea have reduced mortality compared to hatchery-based animals, and also they have an increased growth rate compared to the hatchery control. So uh, if you control the growth conditions, you can have different outcomes uh, of, of animals. The, um, it is, so it is possible to have a healthy population of lobsters growing at sea and use it for commercial purposes or for con uh, conservation purposes. And it looks like that we might be able to uh, stimulate growth or protect uh, against disease uh, using certain microbiota. So that could, uh, for example, influence uh, the and hatchery. You might want to produce a, uh, a material from uh, bacteria living in adult lobsters, and you want to maybe prime the gut of, uh, of lobsters in the hatchery. Uh, so in addition to this, there the, the same group of people. We, uh, we also looked at the uh, shrimp gut microbiome because shrimp obviously is the massive crustacean uh, animal of choice. Um, so we've, in this paper, we can have some, uh, give some suggestions and tips how to do the best studies for uh, shrimp gut. But if people have questions about microbiome studies in general, please contact, uh, contact me. And finally, obviously, people never work alone. So this is uh, Corey, the PC student later postdoc who worked on the lobster project. Carly Daniels from the National Lobster Hatchery, who was in charge of, of the, of the uh, employment at sea. Grant Satterford and David Bass, who are a uh, crustacean pathologist and a uh, biodiversity protozoologist at CFAS, and myself. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, give the word back to Karen. Yes. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. Very exciting and, uh, story. So again, we will have a discussion at, uh, towards uh, the end um, of the meeting. So for now, let me invite uh, Ragnar, uh, Ragnar Fetteros, also from uh, UIS, to share his uh, presentation uh, with us. Please, Ragnar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. OK. Yes. Can you see my person? As well. Yes. Super. OK. So the, the task I got today was to talk about challenges that require industry science collaboration. So I'm going to paint with a pretty broad brush and go rather quickly through some 
issues and um, and end up with some areas that are candidates for collaboration. So it's a very special sector. Uh, what we have what we have seen is that um, uh, there's, this is an industry with profitability margins that uh, would normally have led to rapid growth in other sectors, but that's not happening. And and the reason is that the growth is restricted. Uh, it's partly because of uh, governments that do not give license to grow, but it's also related to real biological challenges. So animal health issues like Mark talked about is a, is a big part of the story here. So what we economists like to say is that there are externalities within the sector and two other stakeholders that that limit the growth. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot going on. There are so many resources uh, and so much knowledge that is devoted to aquaculture in in Norway um, in general and also to to devising new regulations and so on. Uh, so so here's a picture of all the innovation that is going on on closed onshore, closed and semi-closed sea based. I guess Arne is going to talk about that later and offshore technologies. And still the Norwegian government is struggling to keep up with all these opportunities and, and the new challenges that these technologies create. Let me see here. Um, so, so this is basically the story about externalities. Um, it's within the industry, it's between farms, it's diseases, sea lice, and it's to wild salmonids and to other sectors. And here's a need for all types of competence, including uh, all types of uh, many types of scientific disciplines to to mitigate these problems. So this is just a snapshot from earlier this fall, uh, indicating problems with with uh, sea lice, farms about the sea, sea lice limit, and farms with diseases PD and ISAN. So enough challenges here. Uh, sustainable growth in salmon uh, farming depends entirely on innovations in the con conventional open cage systems that we have today and in on land, in offshore production and in the closed or semi-closed sea-based production systems. And, and just to, to take one issue, the issue of sea lice. So this is a way to, to illustrate it. What, what we have seen over time is that uh, with with a given technology, as you increase the biomass of farm salmon in a region, the sea lice population tend to increase. And if this has an effect on wild salmonids, you will see uh, a decrease in the stock of wild salmonids as the biomass of farm salmon increase. The empirical relationship can be discussed. This is just a, a uh, sort of a theoretical uh, relationship that is depicted here. And this is where innovation comes in, because if you are able to to innovate to in the technology so that you for a given level of biomass can reduce the prevalence of sea lice, then you can also have a lower effect, a lower externality towards uh, wild salmonids and um, increase the stock of wild salmonids. Of course, this is a very uh, difficult and contentious issue. There are many influences of wild salmonids and, and aquaculture is, is only a part of the story here. The current regulation of inshore aquaculture has, has several components. It's, it's the components of um, it, uh, its uh, maximum allowable biomass at the farm, firm and region level. We got the traffic light system back in 2017, which regulates growth at all these three levels. And then you have allocation of farm locations by municipalities and so on. And then you have monitoring and inspections to ensure that farms comply with different regulations. Uh, when it comes to the, the sea lice induced mortality on wild salmonids, uh, we have what we call the traffic light system and where uh, the government has defined um, different levels of sea lice induced uh, influence on mortality as as low, moderate, high or unacceptable and where they use different methodological approaches to evaluate this for the 13 production areas. Uh, and that's also um, a very challenges, challenging task to, to say the least. It's in the it's in the court system right now and there's definitely need for more research, a better 
scientific basis for this system. So this is the status that we have today. We have two production areas in in uh, red, and then we have uh, two in yellow and nine in green at the moment. So the question is, how do we increase salmon aquaculture production in a sustainable manner in the future? In the coastal zone uh, with open cages, um, on land or or um, or offshore with closed uh, or open cages, and and also the, it's an issue of uh, the fish that we put into the cages. Should we put small smolt, larger smolt, or post smolt, and reduce the time in the sea where you also have the exposure to uh, to to diseases and more uh, sea lice externalities? So closed uh, farming is by many metrics the most productive food production technology the world has ever seen. If you look at closed aquaculture, there are promises of smaller emissions to the environment, uh, but not in all dimensions. For example, when it comes to CO2 emissions, the emission per kilo of salmon will be higher for land-based uh, farms. Uh, we, we're going to learn a lot about the performance of closed technologies in the future, and there's a lot of innovation that's going to take place. When it comes to exposed ocean technology, that's a it's sort of a great promise. There are 90% of our sea areas are exposed. Uh, there are large scale advantages with remote locations and increased distance to neighbor farms give reduced biological risk. Of course, there are a lot of challenges uh, that uh, MOOC has uh, explicitly or implicitly indicated with harsh weather conditions and, and distance to land and so on that, that add cost and risks. Here's an example of a farm that was designed for exposed conditions, the Salmar uh, Ocean Farm, built in China, and where 60% uh, of, the, of the value is, um, is a com components delivered by Norwegian suppliers. So the government policies are a key to sustainable growth, and I'm not going to go into detail on this table, uh, but we need to regulate uh, production uh, systems onshore, open cage inshore, closed, semi-closed uh, cages inshore and offshore, both uh, the commercial full-scale production and R&D innovation. And we need to find the good balances here, which is very complex because it's about a lot of different externalities. It's about uh, it's about diseases, it's about sea lice, but it's also about climate emissions and other environmental footprints. On Monday, we're going to release a roadmap for offshore aquaculture uh, together with with Blue Planet and STEAM. It's a broad group of, of researchers that have participated in writing the report. You see the short report here. So we have researchers from UIS, Sintef, Contali, and, and Norse and BI, and um, everything is going to be available on, on Monday. And we're going to, we're discussing a lot of these issues that I mentioned in, in that uh, report. And this is uh, a roadmap for actions that we are going to propose on Monday at different stages of the value chain and addressing different challenges uh, in relation to, to offshore aquaculture. So, uh, re with respect to areas of industry science collaboration, I put up some uh, some points, and this is pretty broad and open, I would say. I don't want to be too sort of specific or narrow at, at this stage, uh, partly because um, uh, a lack of, of overview on all the issues and also on, on the uh, expertise at different uh, units in UIS and NORS and so on. So uh, optimal regulation of aquaculture is a, is a big um, issue that requires inputs from different uh, scientific areas. Uh, it also involves uh, government as, as a party, of course. Then we have the issue of improving documentation on and behavior on, on behavior and and the state of wild salmon and particular the influence of, of sea lice from 
uh, aquaculture. The, as I indicated, uh, when it comes to the traffic light system, we need we need uh, better evidence. Uh, so digital technologies, video surveillance, pit tagging, et so and etc. is um, uh, issues here. I'm, I'm working on a project in PO3 and PO4 on that. Uh, moving on, we need further knowledge building and innovation in closed and semi-closed sea-based systems. As I mentioned, Arne is probably going to talk more about that. We need to accelerate the entry of sustainable and cost efficient systems into the coastal production system. We need to close some of the production in in the coastal areas. And here these technologies play a crucial role. And then we have the uh, circular economy of closed land based and sea based systems. And that involves, for example, solid waste handling uh, and resource recovery technology that I know that uh, several researchers at UIS is working on an application these days. For fish feed and fee feed ingredients, uh, we have that broad challenge of developing a, a broader range of, of feed ingredients. And Norse and, and many others are working on that. I was approached by a, a company just yesterday regarding that. Um, then we have off offshore ocean farming which requires innovation in so many areas and where we can really at UIS and NORS tap into our broad competencies uh, related to uh, to petroleum uh, offshore production and all the aspects of that. So that's about operation safety. It's about digital technologies and automation. It's about fish health and, and fish welfare, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the whole issue of <clears throat> digital innovation in all parts of the, the aquaculture industry is really central. And I guess we're going to hear more about that in the next presentation. So, so there's a, enough to, uh, to dig into here. Uh, the question is, what areas should these organizations collaborate on? And, and when I say, when I show these, I show STEAM with its impressive uh, membership and University of Stavanger and Norse, it's it's because most of the actors here today in this seminar are from uh, or in, involved with these organizations. So we need to have a we need to have a good discussion uh, about uh, how we proceed and how where we can take position in competition with other uh, organizations in other regions in Norway and, and internationally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ragnar X. A very uh, great insight and uh, indeed a very smooth transition too to the next presentation of uh, Nawel. Nawel Harbi from Norse. So please, Nawel, um, if you can share your presentation with us. There it is. We can uh, see it already. Yes, please, the floor is yours. Yes. So uh, yes, thank you for actually for the transition. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> so uh, I'm uh, Nawel Garbi. Um, I'm a, a researcher in the um, Integrative uh, Fish Biology Group, uh, North. So uh, the first slide, I will go very quickly if you're not familiar with the company. So uh, North is the fruit of uh, six research um, or merging institutes. Uh, it counts about a uh, thousand employees, uh, which makes it the second biggest institute after Sintef. Nine locations, uh, 40 different nationalities and uh, six uh, research areas, uh, climate, environment, energy, technology, society and health. Oops. Yes. So here are represented. Yeah, here. Uh, I represent a different research area and their multidisciplinarity. So five out of six, uh, basically, of these um, research uh, um, um, uh, areas uh, are directly contributing to sustainable and digital aquaculture, uh, covering the value chain from uh, basic science to commercialization. But, uh, well, enough of uh, Norse. We're here to talk about uh, specific uh, we have a specific reason for being here, and that's the aquaculture uh, challenges, your challenges and um, our challenges. So the, the most significant reason for aquaculture is to provide foods for human consumptions. So 
no pressure. Uh, so in this slide, as represented in the graphs, uh, aquaculture output, uh, which has been increasing since records begin, which begins in 1950, and uh, which is about 10% every year. Uh, and this growth was uh, stably um, increasing or accelerating, especially around the 80s, uh, making up the shortfall in captured um, uh, fisheries productions. So, but however, in the last 10 to 20 years, this uh, intensification of fish production has raised many challenges related to sustainability. Uh, and to stay in a positive uh, note, these challenges can be regulated and certainly better than management of captured uh, fisheries. Uh, and I will show some examples, like specific examples uh, here. So how? By addressing uh, new sustainable feed, uh, making it accessible, affordable, uh, diversification of production system, sludge and valorization pathways, uh, and uh, optimization of the production through digitalization. So what are the different aspects of sustainable aquaculture? So here is a nice definition uh, from the uh, Brundtland 1987 that says that sustainable aquaculture is an ability to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Uh, here, fish biology is very central uh, in sustainable aquaculture. Um, and around that comes uh, different aspects. So uh, the environmental impacts, green uh, operations and transport, consumer, consumer conf uh, confidence. But uh, for today's talk, I'll be focusing on production systems, new feeds, circularity, digitalization. So many of you will recognize their logos and contributions, hoping that I didn't forget anyone. Um, so I will start with a really good example combining all these four aspects. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 uh, called iFishency. Uh, and here the, the, uh, the project counts 11 European companies, SMEs and larger companies, which are represented here in the map. Uh, so you can see the... Uh, the blue circles here are representing the marine aquaculture demonstrations in uh, Norway and uh, in Greece, in Crete. Uh, in green, uh, the green triangle here. Um, Noel, I will um, stop you because I, I think you have um, pressed on something. The, the presentation is not fully showing anymore. Oh. Yes, okay. we can. Should I? That's something yes. wrong going on. Yes, it's uh, it's back up there. Okay, I'll just do this. Yes, yeah, of course. And then and try again. Yes, indeed. I'm trying not to use much the mouse because it's uh, it's, yes. it's very uh, sensitive. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Is it better now? <laughs> we see again the presentation. It's uh, up, and if should I? Let's yeah, say, if you again go to full screen. full screen. Yes, yes, now we are okay. back to normal view. Okay, <laughs> Super, thank you for thanks that. for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, so uh, the green uh, triangles here shows a freshwater aquaculture demonstration, uh, and that's in Hungary, Vita4. And the last blue square, the, the recirculating aquaculture demonstrations in Norway, uh, Germany, uh, the Aqua, and, um, and in here uh, in Malta with the Aqua Biotech. So large scale demonstration will take place next fall. And um, if you are curious and interested to join, don't hesitate to contact me or Lars Ebison. Uh, so the more we are, more fun it will be. And it's of course uh, for free. So <laughs> we're not asking for money. Um, so as you can deduct from the title, the scoop is the integration of uh, expertises um, here um, of uh, and the integration of expertise and, and products uh, like IoT solutions, uh, artificial intelligence based control, new sustainable and valorized byproducts along all this along um, a circular value chain. The output products are um, uh, automatic assessment of fish behavior through uh, Fish Talk to Me. Uh, a flexible and open intelligent biology online steering system called iBoss. Uh, the two will make it for the smart uh, ROS. 
And last but not least, an optimal valorization of waste uh, and sludge from different aquaculture systems, uh, fish species and feed products uh, called waste to value. So as mentioned here, uh, engaging with society here, the RA um, is, uh, is a central during the project. Um, but um, yes, so sustainable feed. Uh, here I'll give some uh, concrete example from algae feeds productions. Yes, so uh, represented here in the picture uh, is the ILG pilot in Mongstad. Uh, that's the infrastructure we use to develop uh, an optimized and optimized microalgae uh, production. Uh, preliminary results uh, conducted in Alaraqua facilities on rainbow trout uh, fish showed uh, a comparable growth um, here, a comparable growth in control diet and, uh, and uh, algae diet groups. So, and you can see there is a higher pigmentation in the algae diet group. Represented here, algae extract, if you're wondering, and uh, dried algae uh, and aqua facilities where the tested, uh, testings were done. And other investigations also showed that 6% microalgae biomass can replace 25% of the fish oil in the diet without affecting uh, the growth in salmon par. Um, in the next slide, an example of the yeast-based feed, which is produced in the fermentation uh, bioprocessing center and BOC in Stavanger. So the uh, yeast candida utilis is uh, chosen for its robustness and uh, suitability for large-scale production. So basically the production uh, principle is sugar-based, uh, gas-based fermentation using side streams nutrients and low value uh, biomass and um, biogas as a source of carbon for biomass production. So uh, here it's representing the, uh, how the fermentation looks like. Uh, this is the biomass ready for drying and this is how it looks dried. So these are 36 kilos that have been uh, uh, done. Actually, it took three weeks basically to get these and uh, they have been shipped to our partners for testings. Uh, another example uh, is the EU project uh, uh, NovoFeed, which stands for characterization of uh, uh, bee products and development of functional feed uh, ingredients. Uh, here again, NovoFeed is developed through, uh, through uh, bioactive peptides uh, and gets uh, tested. Um, so here, another, I will go then straight to the sustainable production. Uh, so I'm not going to results or details, but I'm trying to give an overall picture on what can be done. Uh, so sustainable aquaculture here, uh, a good example is the center for the SFI, the Center for Research and Innovation, which has been built hand in hand with Nofima in 2014. Um, the center is divided in four different departments, uh, the preventive fish health, so these are representing the departments, the preventive uh, fish health, uh, technology and uh, environment, um, fish production and welfare that are led by NORS and the training and recruitments with the UIB. So in brief, uh, we investigate the env environmental uh, limits or limitations, so whether physical, water quality or social related and the optimization uh, of the production system environment. So through 13 projects, uh, basically we uh, cover these topics. Um, so here again, it's a teamwork and key actors uh, with different background are involved. And in addition uh, to this, sister projects are interacting uh, with different projects, uh, adding value uh, to the output. Yes. Uh, another example here is uh, an uh, ISMO tool, uh, which is uh, the use of environmental sample processor for uh, automations. Uh, and it's uh, here it says a specific uh, qPCR-based assay for detection of sea lice, uh, AGDs for salmon and rainbow trout. So the system basically um, collects water samples on site, extracts and analyzes the DNA, sending the result in real time to a, a remote uh, user. Uh, more in, in international level, uh, here is Astral, which has been funded uh, lately, and it's um, 
So Austral uh, is focusing uh, on uh, the development of a new sustainable, profitable and resilient value chains for, for IMTA, so integrated multitrophic aquaculture production. Uh, the consortium, as you can see, is uh, quite large and multidisciplinary and actually well covering the Atlantic. So uh, Austral gather four IMTA labs, including Open Offshore in uh, Scotland and Ireland, uh, flow through inshore in South Africa, recirculation inshore in Brazil, uh, and one prospective IMTA lab in Argentina focusing on regional challenges, challenge based um, perspective, including fish, mollusk, uh, echinoderm, crustacean, and algae species. Now comes a uh, few words about sludge and waste valorization. Uh, a nice example is what we have achieved uh, so far in efficiency, uh, giving a good example of circularity and valorization. So we have uh, in one hand uh, new feeds, uh, feed trials and demonstration in operation and environment. Uh, so here the first input is based on residual fractions, uh, sludge and dirty water. Uh, one step later, the waste is characterized and quantified, indicating the uh, valorization routes. Uh, and suitable matters and sludge valorizations through nutrients uh, and reuse dirty water through the substrate contribute to algae growth, which and then it just goes around uh, like this towards uh, zero waste. So it's a really uh, cool <laughs> concept. Um, then the principle, is, and as an example here, just this principle uh, that has been used for different inputs and tested in different projects uh, is the use of algaes, of course. Uh, here uh, represented the different projects. Uh, in these projects, uh, the microalgae was, sorry, yeah. The, uh, here algae chose algae cultivations and these here, uh, used in, in testing as a feed. Uh, also using residual streams from aquaculture for cultivations uh, here. Um, and uh, ways to use where we're using, uh, um, using residual streams from organic food waste uh, for algae cultivation as well. And then using insect production for uh, the cultivation of algae. Uh, and yes, the facilities in Bergen and the algae that need sun still grow very well. <laughs> so just in case you wonder. Uh, and here just a wing to the Greenfish Farms, uh, which is um, uh, this concept is from a, a Norse company called Prototech. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, so these um, basically describe different aspects in terms of zero waste and cost efficiency. Um, Yes, for the last slides, I will describe the digitalization of aquaculture, which is a tool contributing to sustainability. So um, let's say I will look at it in three dimensions. So the digital fish, digital operations and uh, digital management. So let, let's have let's say you have a fish that is crawling down and uh, bobbling something. You would ask yourself, hmm, what, what is he saying? I mean. Uh, so, how is this fish doing? Uh, you would like to know now, perhaps in 30 minutes, uh, etc. So we can gain more knowledge about this by collecting several sets of data from the environment that affect the fish and put this in context by digitizing, analyzing uh, and predicting, providing an optimal condition for this particular fish. And there you get it translated. Um, so. This digital fish will enable cognitive farming, contributing to better welfare, optimize growth, better operational management, uh, sustainability, of course. And then if we go even further, it will actually uh, help um, in site to site interactions and at a, at a regional uh, management level, uh, including disease outbreaks and so on. So uh, here, this slide is summarizing a mapping process uh, that has uh, happened in the company. We're actually um, showing here uh, the different interactions between these different competences. Um, 
and uh, and which are covering basically the uh, the actual demands uh, in terms of aquaculture, business development, and society. Um, to end uh, uh, on a <laughs> on a really uh, a positive note, uh, it's. Um, I just want to highlight the establishment of the uh, Blue Research um, IS, which is a collaboration of, yeah, as you said previously, North, Team Aqua, and uh, Cluster, and the uh, University of Stavanger. Um, there, be, there was an R&D license uh, that has been already submitted to the Norwegian Directorate of Fisheries, and um, 14 technological projects has been are now in the pipeline to be tested. So this is a great potential for the research um, uh, to develop uh, large-scale commercial um, um, testings. Yes. And yeah, thank you very much for, for your attention. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, I'll try my best to answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Noel. It's a great and uh, impressive presentation. Gives a great overview of uh, the broad variety of activities at NORS, indeed. Um, we will uh, open the discussion round later on, but now I would like to proceed to the, the experience from uh, also some uh, of the industrial partners. Like, um, we will start with Asbjörn, Asbjörn Drengsteg from the Norwegian Lobster, far lobster Farm. So, Asbjörn, if you can please share your presentation. There it is. We can fully see it. The floor is yours. Thank you. And you can hear me as well? Yes, All perfectly. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for being able to present our company and our history uh, uh, for you. Uh, when you're describing uh, or linking science uh, to industry, it's very difficult to avoid the magic word, which is funding. Uh, but uh, I will go more in depth uh, during the presentation. Uh, our history, we are what you can call a well-established uh, startup. We uh, established the company in 2000 and we uh, did a lot of basic R&D. Uh, for many years, we uh, used uh, 40 plus students uh, from business school, uh, University of Stavanger, uh, and then at the uh, IMR in Bergen, Neva, and we were closely linked to the to the R&D institutes. Uh, we had a pilot scale uh, production uh, before we uh, capitalized and went into a semi-commercial production. Uh, we did that for uh, three years, uh, produced two metric tons uh, annually, uh, and that was during the financial crisis. Uh, our commercial setup back then was a completely automated farm, uh, which could be uh, remotely uh, controlled. And that was uh, two years before the iPhone uh, entered in, into the market, so it, it was quite an advanced uh, farm. But the financial crisis uh, hampered uh, further capital growth. And we uh, we just proved the concept during that period, uh, and unfortunately the farm burned down in 2011, and we lost all assets. So that was a dark period for a few years after that, where we uh, mitigated bankruptcy, and we also tried to find uh, new ways on how to produce this cannibalistic uh, animal in a more cost-effective uh, production system, re uh, reducing the initial investment cost. Uh, we received a EU uh, project in 2016 under the Eurostars program, uh, which was um, very successful. We lifted the technology from uh, threshold level 5 to 7, and we got a new EU project in uh, 2019 under the Horizon uh, 2020, uh, where we're going to uh, build an industrial pilot uh, for, for uh, a commercial setup for, for European lobster onshore. And we also submitted a new EU proposal uh, for next year under the Eurostars program. The main uh, idea of doing this uh, work was to control the value chain. Uh, we uh, are the only company in the world that has succeeded to produce lobster from mother and father or hatching the eggs and up to the portion size and uh, Michelin restaurant plates. So uh, we need to control every single element upstream and downstream. Um, and we're also concerned about the environment. So we try to, to, uh, to do an environmentally friendly and sustainable approach for our production. 
Our product is uh, what they said was a superior high quality and we received a very high price in, in the market. And mainly uh, because of the downstream activities that you can see some pictures of here uh, was the main reason that we didn't uh, decide to bankrupt the company, but we decided to stay on because uh, the price, the product and the culinary reviews uh, all over Europe were uh, tier we, say, we knew that this product had, uh, had uh, a way of life. Uh, to meet industry with science, uh, generally uh, to meet all the, the, the challenges for food production and sustainable food production, it's mandatory that science and industry work closer together. Uh, our experience is that the, uh, there's a lack of a good performing uh, cooperation between uh, scientists, uh, R&D environments and, and uh, commercial companies. And for our experience, uh, scientists are very expensive. Uh, so in periods you, you may not consider their expertise value for money because you need to do other tasks, solve other things and you have enough cost to, to, uh, to bear. Uh, so, so uh, scientists are uh, very easily uh, um, not considered uh, to be uh, value for money. Uh, but startups uh, often have a good idea, uh, but they lack the network and the financials to realize their potential. So that's where the funding again comes uh, into to, uh, the equation. And funding can be hard to reach. Uh, and uh, also uh, funding should be, um, be split, uh, funding for the commercial side and funding from uh, the scientific side. So you can split the funding uh, percentage for uh, these kinds of, of projects. If you're going to develop a new product or new technology uh, to produce a new product in aquaculture, uh, it takes maybe 10 to 15 years. We are, of course, a little bit behind uh, because we have been doing this for 20 years. But at the initial stage, you have a lot of uh, need for, uh, for research. Uh, and the need for research, of course, uh, becomes less when the, the company grows. But at that stage, when you need the most research, you also have um, the least amount of money. So in order to, to, to bridge uh, science and, and industry at an early stage, there, there needs to be a, 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 new, a way of thinking how to fund these companies. And you need to have proof of the pudding. You need to have proof of concept uh, before you are able to attract uh, external capital. So this, this is our experience. This is uh, excluded the EU funding opportunities. It's uh, for the Norwegian uh, funding uh, programs uh, where you, when you start up, uh, you have a lot of um, good helpers, which I call them, that can help you initiate your, your company. You can, they can help you to, to, to do different things in terms of uh, business plan, budgeting and so on and you have a good possibility to achieve uh, uh, full financing through grants and, and uh, own funding. But when you grow uh, up to a semi-commercial and proof of concept stage, uh, grants are not working quite as good anymore. And uh, the helpers that can assist you in the growth uh, also becomes fewer. And when you reach the commercial production, uh, there are no grants that can actually uh, sustain uh, or, or, or justify the use of, uh, of R&D in the magnitude that, that the, you need. And that is, of course, a, again, exclude the EU funding uh, opportunities. And when you can become an industrial player, then uh, there are grants and uh, normally you have uh, employees or, or departments that, that handles uh, your own R&D and, and you also have financing to do more R&D on your own behalf. So for, from our side, it's uh, uh, the requirements for linking science to, to industry. You need to have a clear political anchoring and a strategy. You need to pair science and, and industry on a continuous basis. 
And the scientists they need to follow uh, the projects uh, or the companies from the start and until uh, they are well on the way to commercial growth. Uh, it's also important to, uh, to do prioritizing and that is not uh, necessarily only the sectors or, or um, companies or technologies, but also to prioritize which uh, grants are applicable during the life cycle of a startup. So the startups can say that we have uh, possibilities to achieve financing different uh, schemes uh, during uh, the growth of the company. And it's also important, I think, for the, the society or the community to, to, to develop mechanism, how to evaluate or measure the R&D results, uh, what comes out of the, the money that uh, the public is funding for the companies and uh, to, to, to create maybe a platform where you can see where, where uh, which uh, funding scheme is working better than others uh, or in, in different stages. And um, also the funding um, for, from a startup point of view, it's, it's, uh, we, we see it as fragmented, small and very uncertain. So, so I think it's, uh, it's important to, to uh, consolidate the, the funding opportunities uh, and to promote scientific uh, use of scientific uh, researchers in a doable way for the company. And that's why we come to the EU funding, because that is a completely different ball game. Uh, it's all men on deck. If you receive funding from the EU, it's all men on deck. There is no, uh, <laughs> no restrictions. And, uh, but you need to have maybe a, 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 a support system for, for application, uh, report, uh, reporting and also back office uh, services. Our experience using uh, researchers or, or R&D institutes uh, regarding progress in quality, uh, we speeded up the development progress and also the collection of IPR became quite uh, much faster. And the co quality of the R&D uh, was of course much higher than to do uh, research in your own garage. Uh, it will never be uh, completely satisfactory to do uh, a lot of the R&D uh, on your own. You need to have support systems to, to, to use uh, scientific uh, knowledge. But we united the science very early and we, um, the scientists uh, understood our challenges and goals very fast. And we used them also to have a third party validation. Since we are the only one in the world, people uh, struggle to believe, is, it, is this really possible? And then uh, it's uh, an advantage for us to use uh, third party validations uh, to support different, um, different stages of our development, both in the biological side, technological side, market side, and also financials for, for projecting the return of investments. And uh, we have used scientists both on uh, basic uh, R&D and also on, uh, on applied science. Uh, regarding partnerships, it's much easier to have uh, university and R&D institutes as partners because it's more easy for us to secure our own IPRs. And of course, uh, when we raised capital, uh, this cooperation with the, with the scientific side, they added strength because uh, it was more believable uh, since uh, external university and R&D institutes supported this system. And it gave us added value. We could have a higher pre-money value uh, before uh, getting the external capital. But uh, I don't know if, if it's the right term, but we are missing the Tinder portal. Uh, where to meet these uh, researchers? Uh, who is doing the flirting? Will the scientists come to us uh, and, and, and sell the, the services? Or do we, do we need to always to be the one searching uh, for the researchers or the institutes uh, where what are they doing where they can where can they uh, support us and so on so maybe we should have a, an application or an app for for uh, what is the university doing uh, and who are the scientists to to contact so uh, that was it for me. Uh, this is uh, from 2009 from Innovation uh, Norway, the yearly report, and it says they said it was impossible, but it's not. It's doable, but it requires uh, stubbornness. It requires uh, passion 
and it requires uh, a sound funding structure uh, in order to achieve a commercial production of the plate sized lobster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hasbjorn. Very, very interesting uh, insights from your uh, site and very uh, interesting to hear your experience. Like, it's also nice that in the audience, like we also have, for example, people from the uh, from the um, Norwegian uh, Research Council and, and like from the Funding Institute. So hopefully they can also, they also heard your um, your message there. So with this, I think, and uh, we can discuss later on, uh, but we will now first continue with the presentation of uh, Tour, Tour uh, Ludwigsen from Roxel Aqua. We have, uh, yes. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes, please Tour, the uh, floor is yours. My name is Tour Ludwigsen. I work in Roxel Aqua and uh, if you look at the pictures now, I guess it's fairly obvious what we're trying to achieve. Um, we are trying to bring the aquaculture industry offshore by using um, existing jacket platforms and pull down fish cages. The next one, please. The jacket uh, platforms have proven that they can uh, master the rough weather at uh, offshore seas for decades. Uh, and the fish cages will also be exposed to much weather and should be drawn down, in my opinion, in our opinion, uh, when they're offshore. And there also we have like some uh, herding techniques that will enable us to do the herding at more exposed and offshore sites than what is done today. So that's a very brief introduction to what we do. Next slide, please, uh, Karen. For us, it is very, very obvious that we pull down the cages uh, because um, in, the, in the top surface, we have we have lice, we have current, we have, uh, have the uh, strong influence from the waves, and we even have algae. And when we pull down the cage, we can get much better temperature for fish welfare and for, um, and for less diseases and for optimized growth of the fish. It may look like there is not so much temperature difference in the water elevation, but it can be, for instance, like seven degrees further down instead of four degrees at the surface, which is actually quite important for many factors. Uh, next one, please. Uh, okay. So um, we have not so far like done large projects with the research institutions. It's more smaller projects. It's, we are talking one project we have with the uh, University of Stavanger, and, um, and the University of uh, uh, Bergen, HVL, for a new fish concept where uh, University of Stavanger is looking at the hydrodynamics and we will look into um, model, test, uh, model tank testing in, uh, in Bergen. But we also done, had like lots of master thesis and bachelor thesis done uh, in engineering, in economics, and in four different universities, University of Stavanger in Bergen, uh, the old veterinary school in, uh, in Oslo, and in the uh, University of uh, So all these theses are actually very useful for us for many reasons. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of this. So if you go to the next slide, uh, please, Karen. If we take the jack-up rig, which is a central element, of course, of our concept, we've got one master thesis done for the jack-up market, like which um, jack-ups are available. Um, uh, is it best, better to rent the rigs? Is it better to buy the rigs and own them? What, what is more profitable? Another uh, subject we have been looking into is renewable energy. 
if you see the wind turbines and the solar panels on top of the jacket rig, one master student actually calculated for us the consumption you have, uh, how much energy we need, and how much solar panels and wind turbines we need to have on it. It was a very good and helpful uh, master thesis. So if you go to the next slide, uh, Karen, I also see that we have had done many uh, theses on the fish cage, which uh, is about hydrodynamics, uh, crowding, uh, development of a secondary pull-down mechanism. Uh, and we have an ongoing second project on crowding. And we've had an economical analysis of the fish. And if you go to the next slide, we have also done some market evaluation and economic analysis for uh, the fish cage and the whole concept. Uh, and I'll go through one of these uh, examples afterwards. We are looking for, uh, I mean, we, we cannot only concentrate on Norway. We have to look at other places in the world, such as the North Atlantic, or even in international waters outside the, the borders of each country. And we've done one economical uh, analysis of, uh, of our concept. So in total, we've done three masters on this one, and I'll give you an example of one of them in the next slide. Uh, first of all, there are 10 theses we have done, including 18 students. I think that all the students have been quite pleased to uh, work for us or like to write for us. And two of the, of the master thesis got an A, and one of the theses uh, will be probably be nominated for the best thesis at the university that year. If you go further, the first uh, thesis I will uh, just use as an example is a pastel analysis uh, of uh, using octopus in the North Atlantic. And pastel, for those who don't know it, it is, stands for uh, a strategy analysis. Uh, it's about political, economical, social, technological, environmental, and legal. So you're looking at all aspects of a subject and trying to find risks and opportunities about uh about this thing in this case having uh, our concept octopus in the north atlantic if you go further uh, what she she did this student was first to look at the natural habitat of the atlantic salmon where is it natural to put um salmon farms uh, uh and of course you have norway but also uk iceland faroe islands ireland these places. So what is, is, is the temperature, the depth? Is it right for us and the fish? And if you go to the next uh, slide, after a while, she concentrated on the Faroe Islands and she interviewed a lot of people there. She went over there for, for two, three weeks and had a very great site visit, interviewed people in the fish farms, politicians, uh, biologists, and among other, um, the person you see here to the right, Paul Mikkelsen, who was the Minister of Trade and Foreign Affairs, which gave her some uh, great advices of what might happen in the future of, uh, of the Ferrios fish farming. And if you go to the next slide, here is just another uh, example of um, what some students uh, did for us. And I will not explain exactly what this is about. Uh, it, it is still our secret, but what it is about, it is a redundant pull-down mechanism for, for our fish cage, which, um, which is quite useful uh, in case of an emergency and if in case there is a problem with our um, existing um, pull-down mechanism. And these students, they went to the workshop, they welded up a prototype, they did some electronics, and if you go to the next page, 
they tested it in the diving school in Bergen. It may not look like from the picture, but it also worked. In fact, it worked a lot. And great, great uh, thesis. And again, these were nominated or may be nominated for having the best thesis at uh, the University of, um, of Bergen uh, this year, HBL. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is also something we have achieved. We have got some, uh, some group looking into the hydrodynamics of our fish cage and done some testing. Uh, and, and please go to the next slide as well. Okay. In the next phase, uh, when we get a little further with our project and when we get fish in a, a full scale cage, we want to have larger projects with research institutions, and we want to look into um, fish welfare, automation, uh, software development, marine engineering, and it could be lots of other subjects where we would like to cooperate with, um, with the research institutions. In fact, what we aim to do is use our um, fish farm as a sea lab where we can utilize some of the, the available uh, rooms and capacity for people to actually have researchers, students, uh, uh, and everyone who wants to attend to, to actually do research with us. Uh, and if you look in, if you take the next uh, slide, um, well, this is really what I had to say. Thanks a lot for me. Thank you very much. Those are very interesting, very, very great examples of indeed how also like um, student projects can, can give a lot of uh, added value to uh, the, the, the research and the insights also for the companies. Thank you very much. Like Ready then to um, proceed to the last presentation, which is uh, Arne Berge from uh, Fish Globe. So uh, please, Arne, if you can share your presentation uh, with us and explain indeed the already quite well known, uh, or uh, that many people are interested to hear more about it, about your interesting uh, concept. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my yes. screen now? Yes, perfectly. Good, good. Yes. Uh, I am the inventor of this um, cage for growing. Nej, jag tror vi tar i norska. Jag har utvecklat en lucka flytande uppdrättsanlägg för att producera fisk för från smolt upp till cirka ett kilo ett postmoltanlägg. Och här ligger anlägget som har ett drift i Lysefjorden. Och jag ser prekestolen rätt bak uh, globen där. Uh, för att jag ska förstå en, få en förståelse av hur detta fungerar så är, är tanken på 3500 kubik. Den är större än, än någon fisketankare som är på land. Uh, pumpen är onda här och så blir det satt upp ett tryck in i dessa pumpröv som driver en ström så att vatten går runt och runt och så går det ut i avlöpar. Och så har man på toppen tekniska rum som, som fisken eh, samtidigt eh, flyter på. Eh, hvis man är heldig nå, så ska det visa en film och här ser du också hur detta blir byggt. Eh, det är på Östlandet på en sajt den blir byggt. Eh, den är byggt i polyetylen. Eh, det är dubbla vägar. Eh, Ikke stål, ikke glasfiber og ikke betong, men polyt i den så er det vanlige materialer på disse her normale oppdressringene som vi bruker. Den ble satt på sjø og slept fra Østlandet til Rogaland i løpet av et par døgn. Slepehastigheten var 6-7 knop. Helt enkelt å flytte. Den er lagt for å kunne transporteres og flyttes og legges i vanlige fortøyninger. Den, den trenger ingen forflåter, eller, eller den er autonom, men den trenger strøm. Eh, og det beste er jo å få det for land, eh, men den kan også ha en boproduksjon av strøm. 
Samma gäller oxygen med bruk av oxygen tank på land. Men den kan också ha en bo produktion. Med fore i hela diametern, det är två områden som öppnar och här ser det för den strömmen som jag som jag visar, primärströmmen som genererar en, en sekundär ström så gör att alla partiklarna som som faller ner till fisk, fårspill eller fiskeskytt, när de faller ner på botten så blir de med sekundär strömmen flytta in till centrum. Och så är det egna såna små öar som tar upp och flyttar alla partiklarna men vannström upp till filter så de samlar upp allt och tar vara på det i in i det tekniska rum på toppen. Eh fotspel eh har man också att sortera få och runt igen brukar jag ta det tillbaka igen. En av de viktigaste tingen med den lösningen är att med är tätt i toppen så att man kan med och så det på så kan man pressa ut vatten och fisken över i en bondbåt. På den måten så får man väldigt skånsamma flyttning av fisk. Vi har haft två leveranser av fisk i år. Det har kört två generationer. Bilden uppe till vänster här visar att den kopplar samman slangen, alltså fiskeslangen från bondbåten med den slangen som är kopplad till botten av globen. Så här kopplar den det samman. Och så är det att stänga alla lugor och dörrar och så i en stund så stiger den upp av vattnet. Det är bara fyra timmar så kan den komma helt ut av vattnet och då är all, all vatten och fisk flyttar över i brönnbåden. Uh, och här ser du att det ser ut akkurat som i en tank på land. Detta är basically ett landbaserat anlägg som flyter. Här ser du fisken tränger sig samman och går ut i det fisket tappar hålet. Här ser du när fisken är tomma. Nej, när tanken är tomma så är det bara två, tre fiskar igen. Så det här funkar väldigt bra på första försök i full skala. Det ser det lite goda, men i och med att tanken är tätt så kommer det lite sollys in. Så man har mycket mindre gro in i tanken än, än, än i åpne mera. Uh, jag måste säga si det är lite fascinerande första gången när, när du startar med den leveransen här sen så har du en svär båt som ligger på sidan där. Eh och så när det har gått några timmar så, så går du ut på taget här och så ser du ner på ett svärt skip. Det den har stegat då 10 11 meter i löp av av de timmarna. Eh uh, jag vill visa lite resultat för fisken med att göra nu. Eh uh, uh, den gula och blå är, är fisk, fisken vår, eh, men den gröna, den, den gröna kurvan här, det är församlingbar fisk som har gått i rasanlägg. Eh, och på detta punkt här så blir all fisken satt i kör, både fisken som kom från ras och den blå kurvan där fisken vår blev satt i ras på samma tid. Och du ser att fisken eh, var nog lik i störrelse i begynnelsen, men det visar att eh, vår fisk har haft samma växten som i landbaserat anlägg och det är själv om att temperaturen i tanken på vintern var 28 grader av och till 9 och rasfisken hade 14, kanske 15, så hade vi akkurat samma växtkurvan och det, det är lite speciellt att vi har uppnått så extremt god växt och det skyller att vi har en uppsamling av partiklar som vi kan överföra lite grann. Det är så bättre fotspel kan man ta tillbaka igen. Så man kan alltid köra på maximal forentag med vårt system då. Och så såg jag när den närmaste utsatte kö så började tankarna på land och blev ganska fulla och det det började bli belastning på biofilter så det måste ta av lite på den här utvågen. Det började med lysstyring för att få en till att klara som smål för utsatt. Men som är allerede hade en smolt, men hade ju den dåliga växten i starten. Men som är utsatt så var det full fåring, kun, kun fyra dagar med svälting för utsatt. Och i den kom i kö så var, han, så var ju den fisken, den har gått i ren sjövatten i halvt år. Så den var ju på och tog mat med en gång och fick god växt i köen. Men den som kom från landanlägg eh, trängde lite lit tid till att vända sig till den nya tillvärlden den har gått för färskvatten kanske med det salt i fora men växten i sjön tog lite tid för att bygga sig upp som hade stor forspring och i första fasen så så bara ökade det forspringen 
Eh, etter kjør så har det, dette smalet seg inn, for det er jo en mindre fisk, og da skal den ha en høyere daglig tilvekst enn vår fisk. Så, så det, har, det har minket på det gapet, men, men, eh, men eh, vekstresultatene er ekstremt bra i denne lukke enheten. Eh, runde to med den gule kurve viser jo at vi opprettholder samme god vekst, eh, selv om vi hadde litt høyere temperaturer, og ikke lå så mye over tabell, så, så er det fremdeles uh, uh, ingenting å si på veksten i dette nye lukket anlegget. Uh, Asbjørn tog opp noen uh, veldig viktige poeng i sin uh, presentasjon, og det er hvordan han finansierer utvikling. Uh, så jeg har også gjennom mye av det samme som Asbjørn tog opp i det å kunne komme gjennom alle disse stadiene frem til at du har et, et produkt som flyter, som er kommersielt, det er ekstremt krevende. Og det er ikke alle organer og myndigheter som spiller på lag. For meg så begynte det tilbake i 1988. Da tog jeg en ingeniørutdanning på universitetet i Stavanger. Uh, ikke alle vet det, men da heter det Høgskolen i Rogaland. Og de hadde en del år en akvakulturutdanning som jeg tog. Uh, da tog jeg uh, og hadde jeg oppgaver på, på lukket anlegg på land, for det ble bygd, bygd en del laksanlegg på land i den tiden på 80-tallet. Så jeg hadde jeg oppgaver på det. I den prosessen så kom jeg fram til at det var mye smartere å ha et anlegg flytende kjør. Så jeg designet et lukket anlegg i betong som skulle flyde i kjør. Det gjorde jeg da tilbake på slutten av 80-tallet. Det viste jeg til en av ammonuensesene på, på høgskolen, og han tenner i bånd. Og vi jobbet videre med dette, og vi fikk med oss AS Betong, som var den største entreprenøren i Rogaland på, tida, på den tida betongentreprenør, som, som beregnet å jobbe videre med dette her, og lagt en patentsøksmål. Og så fikk vi med oss skretting, så da hadde en teknisk avdeling som drev selv. De selger ikke bare for, men de selger utstyr, og de skulle selge dette her. Så tilbake på den tiden der, så, så holdt jeg på med å lukke anlegg. Eh, men så gikk jo de landbaserte anlegget for laks konkurs, sånn at eh, prosjektet mitt stoppte bare opp. Eh, så i, fra, fra 90-tallet så har jeg da jobbet andre plasser i akvakulturnæringen. Blant annet eh, jobbet jeg med forskning eh, på læring forskningsstasjonen, som er skretting sitt, sin forskningsstasjon eh, som ligger inne i, i Høgsfjorden. Og der eh, var en god erfaring i livet å jobbe med forskere og forskningstenkningen. Og jeg fikk også et stort nettverk innenfor forskningsmiljøet i den perioden. Eh, så begynte det på å komme ideer om nye lukket anlegg tilbake i 2010 og litt etter på det, så ble det testet ut et lukket anlegg inne på Tiertal på Eros Innovation. Det ble kalt Aquadom. Og da begynte jeg å fylle den med interesse, for det var jo det som jeg tog mye oppgaver på. Men så endte det bare opp med at jeg irriterte meg av alle de svage, sånn, så det anlegget hadde, hvordan det var fisken og så videre. Så, videre. så, så, så begynte jeg å tenke, hvordan, jeg, hvordan ville jeg gjort det hvis jeg begynner på nytt igjen? Så begynte jeg med små prototyper. Her er den første jeg lagte på en kubikk. Den var her jeg kjører og testet ut. Alle de løsningene som jeg hadde tenkt ut virket jo så bra at jeg kunne ikke la dette ligge. Så jeg gikk videre til en, en ny. Fremdeles i garasjen ved huset mitt. Eh, når den, de to delene ble satt i sammen, og den ble fem meter høy, så lurte virkelig naboen hva jeg holder på med. Men den ble også satt i kjøen, og den ble, jeg ble filmet hvordan de forskjellige ting fungerte med foropsamling og så videre. Den filmen viste jeg til en oppdretter, og han så at dette var spennende. Så fikk jeg noe støtte til å bygge en, en, en ny globe som enda ligger i Lysefjorden. Uh, da var vi liksom i gang på et skikkelig nivå. Og samtidig så søkte jeg om forskningskonsesjon. Uh, for jeg så at jeg får testet ut dette monofisk. Så jeg, så jeg fikk en forskningskonsesjon i 2016. 
eh, och etablerade då ett systersällskap som heter som, som, som då håller på med, med fisken och testing med fisk, men Fish Globe driver med utvecklad teknologi och särskild teknologi. Eh, och vi hade hållit på ganska länge och designat detta här som, som nå är satt i sjö, den är i drift. Det här är en tegning för det. Och så kom det utlysning av utvecklingskonstitutioner och då sökte med och om en om om utvecklingskonstitutioner får testa ut ett anlägg då som är som är så stort att du kan ha matfisk. Det här är för post fram till en kilo. Och med effekt då eh uh, i årsskift i år ändligt tillsagsbrev på på forsknings på utvecklingskonstitutioner så de kan nå och testa ut ett 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 matfiskanlägg. Eh uh, när man är färdig med design på den. Som, som Aspen var inne på så är det för att kunna dra sådana utvecklingslöp som går över årtier så är det väldigt krävande. Och det är värd att märka sig med detta bild här att, att jag har väldigt många samarbetspartnare. Alltså det nätverket som vi har byggt och har vi brukt aktivt för att få in den bästa kompetensen. Jag har en generell bred kompetens, men jag hade alltid någon som var flinkare än mig som kunde spara. Och det tror jag var avgörande att jag alltid kunde plocka ut det bästa på sitt område faktiskt i världen till att hjälpa mig vidare. Men Arne, det, Arne, if I can just give a time indication for yeah. if in one two minutes. Uh, That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I fact go start the final fossil form to to in a first two project. Or do one of them as a best summer best partner. I have a make control aqua or in a steady bag and or in a set strong have a good summer best partner for me. Det var uh, utfordrande med en sån stor konstruktion i detta material uh, och vanskligt att finna partner i Rogaland som ville ville beräkna konstruktionen uh, för det att det var det var utanför det som som ingenjörmiljö kunde men det slut fant det någon som som kunde ge detta för mig och det visade att det den stora konstruktionen kunde byggas och det var på grund av i brukt tillförsel och avloppsrör som skelett till att bära konstruktionen. Här är en uh, ny rapport från Ofima på som var på detta projektet som var finansierat av uh, RFF Rogaland. Uh, här är några av som som jobbar. Här är CFD analyser på toppen så vi ser tanken uppanta med med pumpor och så. Vi jobbar så vi gör nog väldigt många kajs för att finna en jämn ström i hela diametern på tanken. Sån har vi jobbat. Här visar växten i de två generationerna. Här är det den blåa tabellen och här är utfrågan. Här är vi långt över det som man får tabell, men på andra generationer så låg man också på tabell. Lite av det som vi ska jobba med vidare. Här visar oxygenkurvan in i tanken. Och då ser att det svinger mer än det som är ganska. Grunden till att svinga är för att det utvändiga oxygen svinger. Den grejer inte med dämma upp, själv om det tillför mer oxygen för att dämpa. Så har vi en svingning invändigt på grund av utvändig svingning av oxygen. Vi har lagat massa data. Och vi önskar samarbeta med någon som vi kanske håller på med maskinlärning eller på andra måter. Vill hjälpa oss till att se på effekter av utfordringen på detta och temperatur och oxygen. Så vi önskar samarbeta på att lära mer av alla data som vi har samlat på två generationer. Vi har också eh, lagrat data på ström och vind och vi har målt kapacitet på förtöjningarna. Så här är det eh, möjlighet för att göra projekt och tillbaka till det som du sa, Truls, så är det ting som vi önskar samarbeta om. I tillägg så har vi massa slam som vi samlar upp som och en resurs för vidare arbete. Det var väl det som jag hade tänkt att säga. Tusen tack. Thank you very much. Uh, and a very interesting
And uh, also, indeed, thanks a lot to all the presenters for sh uh, sharing all the um, extremely interesting insights. Um, we have only a few minutes left for the uh, Q&A, but maybe, uh, Kirsty, are there um, uh, questions have there been that have not been answered in the in the chat? Uh, there is actually one question from Fiona Proven that hasn't been answered, and it mm -hmm. is in Norwegian. Har noen kjennskap til status for nye utlysninger i RFF Rågaland, regional forskningsfond her det? Anyone? It's not directed specifically yeah. to one of the no, presenters, no. but... I can... Uh, I can see yeah. noe jeg, jeg setter som observatør i, i styret. Asbjørn er også medlem. Men uh, det ligger ikke ut noe på hjemmesiden foreløpig, men planen er at det kommer på nyåret. Uh, og da blir det kvalifiseringsprosjekter og hovedprosjekter. Okay. Så det, det kommer, så stay tuned, altså gå inn på, på hjemmesiden og følg med ja. der. Flott. Ok, um, Truls, vil like, um, du like to add uh, something? Ja, yeah, jeg vil bare si at det var jo veldig inspirerende å høre de her forskjellige innspill, og spesielt det som Asbjørn og Arne kom inn på, hvor de utfordrer oss litt i den der interaksjonen imellom hvordan uh, akademi og vitenskap og, og, og industri skal jobbe sammen. Og jeg tror de innspill uh, kan være veldig god grobrunn for, for å ta opp om, måske legge til forhåret, hvor vi på en måte diskuterer det her videre. Det der er sket nu, det er at universitetet har organiseret sig veldig mye med det her OTIX, hvor, hvor man samler både bio og teknologi, og så, så ser vi lidt på, hvordan vi skal end, blive endda bedre på en måde på den der kommunikation der. Så, så, så tak mange gange for, for de her fine præsentationer, og til Karen også for at stå blandt organisatoren på det her. No. Okay, well, indeed, thank you. I think we are um, great in time. Uh, like, I, I hope that all the questions in the, in the chat otherwise have been answered. Of course, like, uh, get in touch uh, either with people at uh, STEAM, with us at University of Stavanger, or with uh, people at NORS, everybody. I hope it was useful and uh, possible to, um, to, to learn new things and see new people and maybe uh, have um, wanting now to work uh, with new people on all these exciting uh, projects. We will share the material of the recording uh, afterwards uh, and I would uh, really like to thank all of you for your um, enthusiasm and for uh, to join for this uh, webinar and see you next time. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> go ahead.